I want to spend just a little time, and then we'll, go, then we'll do the large group. I want to just do a little more. Oops, I, guess I can take mine off because I'm talking. <laughs> you can hear me. And this is on. So good. Um, this sheet calls the instruction on the historical truth of the Gospels. You might also have your textbook and open it to supplementary reading number two, I think. Yeah. These are the same thing. What you have on the handout is an excerpt of the actual document. What you have in your book is a summary of it. Okay? So, um, let me just, let, we're going to read through the document, uh, some bits and pieces. Uh, and then we'll look at the summary, and I'll show you. This is, a re this is, this is let me give you the history. Th there is an organization as part of the church that is the Pope's panel of experts in the area of scripture study and scholarship. It's called the Pontifical, as in Pope, Biblical, as in Bible, Commission as an organization. They were formed in 1910. Um, they were a panel of, of bishops, initially, bishops and archbishops and cardinals. And they would have a few experts who weren't bishops, but it was the bishops who did the speaking, because this was an arm of the magisterium. When they spoke, they weren't just giving opinions, they were saying, here is what we Catholics I need to ask if you're not eating, please put your masks up, please, if you're not eating. Sorry, just, if you're not eating or talking, so for the sake of the whole common good here. Um, uh, that, um, I, just, I know, it's, I get to wear without one, so it's not fair. Life isn't fair. Um, the, this, so a panel of experts that the, the Pope has called into being, it still, it still exists, until 19... 69, it was made up of, again, yeah, bishops, cardinals, and archbishops. So it was an authentic part of the teaching magisterium. Okay? After 1969, it was made broader so that other lay people, women, could be part of it. And so to make it a more, it's more now, it's, it's less a group of bishops and archbishops and cardinals there are, there are plenty of them on there. It's a larger group of, of, of biblical scholars. But in doing that, in, in, in making it more embracing, it has lost its regular arm of, as part of the magisterium. Not to say that it's not important or that its, it's, it's uh, documents don't have purpose. But as far as the teaching authority, if they're not picked up by the Holy Father or re, re, re uh, spoken, readdressed, they, they are there for our advice. So 1969, or 70, was the year that changed. That's important because this document has a date on it. 21st of April, 1964. The Pontifical Biblical Commission issued a document on the historical truth of the Gospels. For Catholics, how do we understand the Gospels as history? Are they, are they just mere history? What you see is what you get. You know, Jesus actually said this. And so if, if there's a Last Supper account at the beginning, no, I'm sorry, if there's a, a cleansing of the temple at the beginning and a cleansing of the temple at the end, well, then he must have done it twice. See, that, I mean, if you, take them, if you take the Gospels as mere history, that's what you come up with. Here is, here is the church's vision. By the way, if you have your pocket catechisms, pull them out. And you'll find in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, this document is there. It's in it. Paragraphs 115 to 20 or so. So not only is this uh, uh, the document of the PBC when it had magisterial connections, it was picked up, actually first, at the Vatican Council. It was part of the document on divine revelation. Okay? Uh, and then it was picked up again by the catechism. It may be a shock to you, 
But the documents of the Vatican Council weigh more than the Catechism. I think some people think the Catechism weighs more than the Gospels, but you know, they don't. It's, it's, a, it's a summary. It's a, it's, a, it's a reference volume. But I'm pleased. I'm very pleased it's there. Re-emphasizing this is how we as Catholics understand Basically, it comes down to that the Gospels came to us in three stages. Stage one, so you can have your, this alongside, and then we'll read. Stage one, uh, what you should do is on that white sheet I gave you, you see paragraph seven? Write stage one over that. That's stage one. Paragraph seven. Christ our Lord joined to himself. That's stage one. So stage one is what Jesus actually said and did. That's pretty obvious, huh? He said and did. Now let's read from that paragraph seven. Christ our Lord joined to himself chosen disciples who followed him from the beginning, saw his deeds, heard his words, in this way were equipped to be witnesses of his life and doctrine. When the Lord was orally explaining his doctrine, he followed the modes of reasoning and of exposition which were in vogue at the time. He accommodated himself to the mentality of his listeners. Okay? So Jesus spoke and did various things, but he recognized he was speaking to first century Jews. So he accommodated himself to that. He didn't say, you know, guys, there's a continent named Australia. You haven't discovered yet. <laughs> he didn't say, you know, the earth is really round, and it's the earth that spins. He accommodated himself to what they understood. Okay? That's pretty simple, huh? Stage one. Okay? The next paragraph, paragraph eight, right in stage two. The apostles proclaimed above all the death and resurrection of the Lord as they bore witness to Jesus. They faithfully explained his life and words while taking into account in their method of preaching the circumstances in which their listeners found themselves. So, they, so again, you're teaching a catechism class. Let's say last year you taught confirmation. This year you're teaching second graders. Will you use the same notes? We hope not. Okay? You have to accommodate yourself to that audience. Or let's say your teacher, your pastor has called you and asked you to teach somebody to work at RCA, people who have no no background, no background in faith at all. Would you handle them the same way you handle an eighth grader in CCD? Probably not. You have to be aware of your audience. Back to the text. After Jesus rose from the dead and his divinity was clearly perceived. Notice, after Jesus rose from the dead and his divinity was clearly perceived, what does that phrase assume? That before Easter, Jesus' divinity was not clearly perceived. Now that might shock you. But we do not Expect, I do not expect, the disciples do not show that they understand who Jesus is. They're drawn to him. They, they're amazing in their dropping everything and walking along with him. But they don't have a clue, as Mark will reveal to us as we read. Okay? After Jesus rose from the dead, and his divinity was clearly perceived, faith, far from destroying the memory of what had transpired, rather confirmed it, because their faith rested on the things which Jesus did and taught. Skip the whole next sentence. On the other hand, there is no reason to deny that the apostles passed on to their listeners what was really said and done by the Lord with that fuller understanding which they enjoyed, having been instructed by the glorious events of the Christ. Next sentence. So just as Jesus himself, after his resurrection, interpreted to them, that's from Luke's gospel, the words of the Old Testament, as well as his own, they too interpreted his words and deeds according to the needs of their listeners. 
devoting themselves to the ministry of the word, that's from the Acts, they preached and made use of various modes of speaking which were suited to their own purpose and the mentality of their listeners. Next sentence. But these modes of speaking with which the preachers proclaim Christ must be distinguished and properly assessed. And then they list what we used to call literary forms. Catechesis, stories, testimonia, I would say proverbs, I'm sorry, uh, pa um, parables, okay? So you gotta, so what, what's, what, what's two saying is the apostles first proclaimed Jesus orally. They didn't write books. That's not saying none of them could write. It's not saying that people weren't writing some things. But the spread of the gospel happened not because of Amazon Prime, <laughs> but because of the apostles and eyewitnesses going out and preaching. And when, when they looked at their audience, they preached in different ways based on their audience. You can see this in the Acts of the Apostles. When Paul is preaching in a synagogue, he uses all kinds of quotes from the Bible, the Old Testament. When in chapter 17, when Paul is in Athens on the Areopagus, preaching to a bunch of pagans, he never mentions the Bible at all because they, it, it would have no significance for them. Okay? Instead, he quotes a philosopher. Paul accommodated himself. So stage two, important stuff. It's an oral, the, the, the gospels were preached before they were written down. Second, the, it was post-Easter that the apostles understood what Jesus was. They didn't fully understand him until Easter. And that new discovery didn't distort their picture of Jesus. It clarified their story of Jesus. That's what's wrong with the skeptics who take the miraculous out of the Gospels. If Jesus, St. Paul will say, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we are the most pitiable of people because we are listening to lies. Okay? So the, the Easter is not extra credit. It's essential to our story and our faith. Okay? That's stage two. Stage three is, guess what? Paragraph nine. That's stage three, the written Gospels. This primitive instruction, skip four lines, was committed to writing by the sacred authors in four Gospels for the benefit of the churches with a method suited to the peculiar purpose which each author set for himself. From the many things handed down, they selected some things. That's my idea of a, of a buffet reduced others to a synthesis, that is, they summarized and blended things together. Others they explicated, that means they expanded, as they kept in mind the situation of the churches. Okay? Notice those phrases. They selected, they synthesized, they expanded. Okay? Again, they're not just saying Jesus picked up a pen, and he did this, or he looked to the left. They're not just recording, chronicling little things. Sometimes they, they, they selected, and, and they synthesized, and they expanded. About eight lines down where it says, since the meaning of a statement, see that? Since the meaning of a statement also depends on the sequence, the evangelist, in passing on the words and deeds of our Savior, explained these now in one context, now in another, depending on their usefulness to the readers. The, the old image for this is think of a, a, a string of pearls. And if the string breaks, the pearls will all... And how do you put them back up? How do you, what order do you put them back in? So the author is saying, well, the evangelists, when they pro, the preachers, when they proclaim, didn't necessarily always... You know, put a pictures, photographs. My parents' photographs of us kids always had dates on them. You know, Monday, or I would say May 1960 or June 1964. Now you've got the time and the minute now with, with electronic things. Well, the gospel stories don't come with that. And so the evangelists sometimes move things around. So don't sweat it, is what they're saying. Okay? 
They're saying the individual stories didn't come with a timestamp on them. And the evangelists arranged them in the way that they thought best. I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the cleansing of the temple at the end of the story. I think that's how it really happened. John puts it at the beginning of the story because John has a theological purpose. Jesus is here to replace the temple. And he wants us to know that already in chapter 2. He is replacing the temple. So for a theological reason, not because he knew it came earlier, he moves that earlier. Um, the bottom of the first column, back to the, the sheet. For the truth of the story is not at all affected by the fact that the evangelists relate the words and deeds of the Lord in a different order and express his sayings not literally but differently. Okay? That's the third stage. Paragraph 10. Unless the exegete, and exegete again is somebody is to draw out. Ex means out. Uh, the, the, the jeet part means to draw or lead. To lead out the meaning. You are exegetes, boys and girls. You are trying to draw out the meaning of the text. Unless the exegete pays attention to all these things, drop four lines, he and she will not fulfill his task of probing into what the sacred writers intended and what they really said. So, now look at your textbook and you'll see the same three stages with some, a highlight or two. Okay? This is really important stuff. So do you have questions about it? Understanding what the, the Pontifical Biblical Commission is telling Catholics, how we should approach the Gospels. Any questions? Is this a shock to some of you? I suspect. Because you, you just would have assumed they're Gospels, they're the truth, so they just recorded what happened. No, not just what happened. If they recorded just what happened, they wouldn't be much help to us. Because remember, the apostles didn't have a clue. If they had just recorded what they saw, they wouldn't have much. It's after Easter that they understand. Peter. Somewhere in our 2,000 year history, we must have had a more fundamentalist approach like our evangelical brothers and sisters do now. We've all, there have always been people who've read the scriptures that way. And the church has always read the scriptures more broadly um, back, in, back in the early centuries. So you, have, you, you do have uh, an example, um, Marcion, not Marcion, yes, not Marcion, Montanus, Montanus, second century. He read Revelation that it meant the end of the world. They gathered on a mountain and they expected to be taken up to heaven. Montanus, M-O-N-T-A-N-U-S. Okay. Meanwhile, you have Origen, who is a Christian. And Origen, remember the story? I think I read this to you last year. Remember the story of, um, of Lot and his daughters when they leave uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, and Mrs. Lot becomes a pile of salt. And they're afraid that there's nobody in the world left, so the girls, the daughters, get their dad drunk. And then they have kids. Origen thought, that's crazy. That's a crazy story. So really what that's about are the virtues. <laughs> the, two, the two girls are, I can't think of what they are, but, but they, he's got, he, he totally takes it out of the historical and makes it a, store, a statement about human virtue, and that they lack human virtue. So the church has always had people who, now since, since the Reformation, because the Bible is the Pope for Protestants, there's been a tug. We've been tugged in that direction. Catholics have been tugged to become more literalists because many Protestants are. We feel we've got to defend that of ourselves. So that's probably what you're thinking. Stephen. And uh, kind of where my question picks up is, so how do they wrestle, literalists wrestle with all of this? Or is it, you know, here or they generally say he preached twice or three times. Or they find, or they, they I mean, I'll bring a book. They, they, these are smart people. These are not 
These are not yokels. But because they've already wedded the idea of biblical fundamentalism to their faith, they have to find a way around. So they'll often, in the end, they'll say, well, these aren't the original texts. These are copies of copies. So the original probably didn't have it that way. Which isn't really an answer. It's just an escape. But I'll bring, I'll bring a book. Maybe during break, I'll bring one of these books. Really, it's worth reading just to see how they think. Because it's, it's, really, it's really good thinking. But it's because they've already yoked themselves to taking everything literally that they've got to find a way to make it make sense. Yes, Therese. Isn't also the reason that it wasn't written down earlier because they thought Jesus was coming back? Well, you could argue that. Now, that's kind of hard to prove, but yes, you don't paint the stateroom if the ship's going down. So that might have been part of it. And with, with the dying of the disciples, the, the eyewitnesses, that was surely an impetus to writing it down. But don't think that they couldn't write or nobody thought of writing, but the impetus to write was, as, 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 as decades move on, the, the need to write it down and the church is growing becomes stronger and stronger. Other questions? So three stages. Could you explain this to your children or your spouse if they asked? Again, I'll do it real short. There's the word and deeds of Jesus. He accommodated himself to his times. He didn't speak about signs that, that they didn't know. Second, the, the, the gospel was preached. And, uh, and because it was, it was an oral tradition, oral culture, uh, again, the, the, the preachers took stock of their audience and, and, and they had that in mind as they presented their material. Their vision was expanded and clarified by Easter and Pentecost. Not messed up, it was improved. And then the author, the evangelists, took what the, eyewit what the preachers preached and put it into writing. Okay, so it's, three, so it's not just that the evangelists are going back to note that Jesus left. They're taking the things that the preachers preached and organizing them. Synthesizing, summarizing, explicating. Yes? Just a comment. I think something that's been helpful um, when I work with people in RCIA <clears throat> who maybe come from that literalist background is that instead of looking at being shaken by this, thinking of there's a greater truth that surpasses time and space that we find in these gospel passages and that is actually a, a bigger, greater divine revelation than, which is, you know what I'm saying? Which, which actually um, is kind of as Catholics is to me, you know, more important or that's a bigger, a bigger truth, the capital T, than the historical account. Sure, I, I accept that, you, but you, you sound to me defensive. Oh, no, not the I'm not saying, I mean, I know you're not. Leanne, I know you. You're not being defensive. But you're saying, oh, don't, don't look at the man behind the curtain. No, look at the man behind the curtain. This is how the texts were written. That's why they come off this way. Not because we should just overlook that and focus on this. No, there's a reason. This is not an embarrassment. We're not embarrassed about this. This is, this is good news. And, and we understand how it came. We have more understanding and awareness how it came to be. Look at the gospel. I know you just looked up Mark's gospel. Put up a pen or a sheet of paper in Mark. Look at the beginning of Luke. That's two books later. Just in case. Just in case you don't know. Chapter 1. Luke begins the gospel with a literary prologue, which is, which, he's a fancy writer. He's a fancy pants writer, okay? He's a Dickens, okay? Compared to Mark, is kind of like you and me, okay? And he starts out, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. 
Now that you have read the Pontifical Biblical Commission's document, does this not speak to you differently? Luke acknowledges that before he writes, he knows there's other people who have written. It's not this three guys each trying to write down what Jesus said directly. Luke acknowledges there are people out there who've done this before me. All right? And then he says, so he says, as many have undertaken. How many is, is, is as many? More than two. <laughs> okay, so Luke is saying that there are at least three texts that he knows before he sits down to write. Now, raises the question, why does he write? He must find something lacking for his audience, for his church. Maybe, maybe his church are all sophisticated people, or maybe they're city folk, or maybe they're intellectuals. Okay, and so he's got to, so he felt the need, even though there are many of them out there, he had to come up with another one, he decided. What did he do? He went back. First, the, the things which have been accomplished, that's stage one, the things Jesus did and said. Just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and preachers of the word, that's stage two. And Luke himself is in stage three. Okay? I think you, will, you should find this freeing. You should find this like, ah, oh, so I don't need to feel bad about these tensions that I sometimes see in the text. The tensions have a reason, have a purpose. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them at all. Why did John write it this way when Luke wrote it this way? Don't say, well, one of them is wrong and the other one's mistaken. No. They each have a particular audience in mind. And they've synthesized or selected or explicated things differently. Okay? If I see you on the street for the next month, I'm going to stop you and say, tell me about the historical, the historical uh, uh, truth of the Gospels, okay? You should have that memorized, those three stages. Three words. Yes. <laughs> So, should we move and start the small group discussion via a large group? Do you want to take a break? Let's take a stretch. Keep it on. Keep it on if you can. Check my battery. Okay. Based, number one, based on supplementary reading one, truth and its many expressions. By the way, stop. stop. You have to remind me, when you ask a question, make sure I reiterate the question, because the people who are watching don't always get to hear you, and I already forgot to do that. So when you ask a question, say, please repeat, okay? <laughs> then I'll repeat it to them. Okay, that's number one. Based on the first supplementary reading, summarize the Catholic Church's teaching in regard to biblical interpretation. Who can do that for me? Oh, come on. Where was supplementary reading one from? Ah, Reader's Digest, where was it from? Come on. Where was it taken from? What now? The Catechism. The Sacred Catechism, I think, wasn't it? A Dei Verbum? Oh, shoot, okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So who can summarize things that you should remember? Okay. Go, go, Joe. The Catholic Church teaches us in regard to reading the Bible that we need to understand that all parts of the Old and New Testament in their entirety are sacred and canonical. Having been written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author. We need to carefully investigate the meaning of the scriptures. To do this, we need to recognize the literary context, carefully investigate the meaning of the scriptures, not confusing the types of literature. We must also recognize the historical context, the time in which it has been written, and the cultural situation out of which the text came. Finally, we must take into consideration the application of the meaning of the scripture to our situation today. Woo! That's hot. 
She's got it all. Again, remember, the whole of Scripture... I turned it off here. One second. The whole of Scripture is inspired, but God's the author and human beings are authors too. And we use different forms to communicate. Knock-knock jokes, recipe card, parking ticket, <laughs> epic. Okay? And if you know what kind of writing the author is presenting, you will have a better sense of how to understand what the author intended and what he tries to communicate. Pay attention, it's all inspired, but God's the author, human beings are the authors as well. Human beings speak in literary forms. So you need to understand, ask yourself, what kind of writing is this? What kind of literary form is it? Before you try to come to a conclusion onto what the author is trying to communicate to you. Something like that, you did well. Any question about that? Well done. Number two, do we really have to do number two? Would someone want to do number two? Based on your understanding of supplementary reading number two, summarize the Catholic Church's teaching in the three stages. Dan will say one, two, and three, won't he? Okay, we won't spend time on that. Yes. Number three. Share some incident from your past or your family's past where understanding the meaning of an event has proved to be more important than remembering the exact details of the incident. Now, usually you know I avoid questions like that. But I wanted you to do this one because I wanted you to see how this circumstance takes place in your own life. Anybody got a story where the overall story matters more than the actual details? Stephen, big voice, take your mask off for this, please. It's not a personal one, it's yesterday. What happened? 9-11. Ah, can you, can you elaborate a little? Uh, I was talking to a much younger coworker, and we were sharing, so he was in high school when, um, when it happened, and we were sharing our experiences, what we remember, what we, you know, the details, individual details that we recall, but the end result is, is we went to war for 19 years. That's what he knew. Uh, essentially, yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to a point, you know, you, you don't remember the specifics. You remember the emotions and uh -huh. feelings. Um, Just think, if we divided into halves, and I said, just a sheet of paper, I want you guys to record what you learned, how, what was on TV, how, what, you know, what tower went down first, and what floor, and what plane, and, and, and you did over here, same sort of thing. You would not have the same, even though you're trying to convey what actually happened, what, what you remember has been shaped by, by what's happened since. Huh? And, and so you might be trying to tell the same story, but, but it would come off differently. Right. Good. Another example, that's an excellent example. Another example, mask off, big voice. Um, an incident from my past where the meaning of the event is more important than knowing the exact details of the incident. When I was five years old, my mother gave up a child for adoption. Mm -hmm. Almost 60 years later, my sister made herself known. Of course, we never know the details, but that doesn't change the significance of her actions. She already had six children with three different fathers and resented how they ruined her chances for a good life. Getting rid of a seventh, possibly an eighth, child seems so cool, but the meaning of the actions could affect us all. My mother had the relief of, raising, of not raising more children than, than she couldn't already handle, and the six of us were saved from her total rage which was sure to surface, and we were all spared the responsibility of taking care of the nurturing of more siblings. Best of all, the one and maybe two siblings were released for adoption because they were given the opportunity to be raised in a loving home. Kathy got the better outcome, and we thank God for making it happen. Wow, that's a very powerful story. Uh, if you didn't hear that online, uh, uh, Marlene spoke about uh, in her family, she had a sibling who was adopted. The house was very full. Uh, growing up and, and having six children already and 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 
you know, the, what the, the impact that had, didn't, they didn't know the details, but how that's impacted their lives and the lives of the children who were raised in other homes. Very good. Okay. You can see the, you know, where this could go, huh? Yeah. Number four. What is the most important thing that you have learned from your study of the Catholic Church's teachings on biblical interpretation and the three stages of gospel formation? Can somebody speak to that? What's been most significant for you? Could a couple of you do that, please? Please, Lynn. Uh, I just said in Big order, voice. In order to critically interpret scripture, we not only must recognize the literary, historical, and social, or cultural, and rhetorical context, but the key there is we have to apply the meaning to our current situations. Okay. Yeah, not just, just to know what happened back then, but so what? It's not just, you know, what did it mean to them, but what does it mean to us? So what? Another person, please? Please stand and mask. I guess. Big voice, though. Big voice. Sorry. You're, I'm your child, and you're calling me home. Okay. <laughs> example of how God works through each of us. So each of the evangelists, told, they told the story for their people, how they, would, how they would understand it, but also how they themselves understood it. If we all, like we were just talking about, if we all told a story of the same event, it would all come to us differently, which points back to God's unique role in each of our lives. Absolutely. Excellent. Good point. Very good. Very good. You know, we and I, I, I just finished reading a book that someone gave me. It's a history of, uh, of, of a, a man who was a member of the um, cabinet of the Civil, the Civil War of the Southern States, Jefferson Davis's Secretary of State, Judah Benjamin. He was Jewish, and that was a rare thing. Now, the author of the book is Jewish. So guess what? The, and it's the 1980s it was written. In the 1980s, biography often had a psychological twist to it. You know, why was this this way? I think it's really dangerous. I'm going to warn you. Don't try to psychoanalyze Jesus. People, preachers, do it all the time. Jesus felt this. We don't know what Jesus felt. I don't know what you feel. So be careful. We all need to be careful. But anyway, in this book, the author, it was a good book, well written, but he's always psychoanalyzing Judah Benjamin because he's a Jew. He must have felt this way. Well, that was the author projecting his own stuff on Judah Benjamin, I think. He's telling us more about himself. So I think we do learn something about, you know, we don't have a lot of details on the about Mark and Matthew and Luke. But when we read their Gospels, we're learning something about them. About what, again, if I watched you at a buffet, what you eat, what you don't eat, I know something about you. Okay? What, why did, in Luke's gospel, why does Luke, why does Mark and Matthew have only one story of Jesus and money where Luke has nine? Now, now that's a psychological question that I can solve, but that's his point. It, the author, not just his audience, maybe Luke's audience was, had money problems, they had too much money. That kind of problem, huh? not the one you think you have. Um, or Luke himself maybe struggled with that, and so that becomes part of it. We don't know, we just we have to be careful. But Excellent, good answers. Number five, again, if there's a couple of you who want, there's a lot to be said about this. Um, um, Based on your reading of Introduction to the New Testament for Catholics, A, what are three most important things that you learn from chapter two? Who could get me the, that's pretty factual, huh? That should be pretty simple. No personal heart-rending stories. What are some things you learn from Kelly? Please, you know, Peter. I, I, never, I never had an understanding of this holistic process. You know, it was, it, it was just something I, could, I couldn't grasp until I realized that the gospel writer, writers all wrote in, in Greek. Yes. You know, and I, that, this was like, what? You know, all this time I thought they wrote in uh, English. It, like it, Jesus. It, well, <laughs> <laughs> but it was 
translated <laughs> from Hebrew, not yeah. from Ah, not from I see, I see. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 uh, so this was just like uh, a what, you know, what, what now moment. You know? Great, yeah. good, good, good. Yeah, how about, rather than three, I'd like to hear single ones from more, many more of you. What's one thing from Kelly that struck you? Yes. Um, one that struck me most was the uh, learning the background of all the groups at the time of Jesus. The, Sam the Sam Samaritans and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Pharisees and all that. I've heard a lot of those in the Bible growing up, but I never knew. What Great. The so you got a historical background about those groups. In, in, there's not just, you say Jew, not just one, there's many different kinds, like Christians. We know there's many kinds of Christians. Uh, but there's many kinds of Jews in Jesus' day, too. Good. What else? What did you, did you learn? Yes. Scott. That the uh, Romans ruled present-day Israel at the time of Christ, and because of Jewish uprisings, they were worried that Jesus, the king of the Jews, would lead a revolution to drive them out of the region, which was not his intention at all. It's, it may be hard for us, not maybe not so much for anymore, but that the idea that there's a political element to the gospel. I know you don't want to hear more politics, particularly from me, but there's a political element into the gospels. What does Jesus... So, as one author, as Jesus was coming over the Mount of Olives on Palm Sunday, huh, to enter Jerusalem for Passover on the east side of the city, Pontius Pilate was coming up from Caesarea, the Roman capital down by the, by the shore, with, it, with his soldiers, because, because the procurator had to be in the capital for the holiday with his soldiers in case there was trouble. So the ir irony is, just as Jesus is coming down, Pilate's coming up. <laughs> and there's going to be a square, a, squ a square off or a crossing, a meeting there. What else? Who else has something to share? I just have one more. On this sure, Pete. You know, I have a, I'm not sure I still have it right, but, uh, you know, we had a Jewish king and a Roman governor. Did the governor, was he subject to the Jewish king? Um, at the time of Jesus' birth, there was a Jewish king who was responsible for the whole of it. That was Herod the Great. Yeah. By the time of Jesus' adulthood, Herod the Great is dead, and two of his children have proved to be inept. And so only one of them, Herod Antipas, yeah. remains as king of Galilee only, up in the north. And Pilate and the procurators are responsible for the south, Judea, where the capital Jerusalem is. So that's why in Luke's gospel, uh, Herod comes down to Jerusalem that's that scene of Jesus Christ Superstar where, where uh, he, you know, walk across by swimming pool thing, if you're old enough to remember that. that. But they ruled separately. It's just that during Passover, sometimes the king would come down as well as the procurator, be both in Jerusalem. So he happened to be in Jerusalem. Happened to be. Jesus. Uh, yeah. Okay. Neither of them were regularly there. Okay. Anything else? Other thing you want to share that you learned from Kelly? Yes. Eschatology. Yeah, so my question was, which I wasn't, was able to answer, why is that particular time Jesus has to come? Why did Jesus come the time he came? Yeah. Oh my gosh, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, we'll come back to that after we've dealt with Mark. I don't have an answer for it. I mean, they'll, they'll say, I'll give you an, ex an example. Uh, in, in the Roman world, what was going on at the time was uh, Jesus was born during the reign of Caesar Augustus. Caesar was after 70 years of civil war, or maybe 50 years, 50 years of civil war, Caesar Augustus was able to bring stasis to the empire. Before that, there was constant civil war, 50 years of it. So for a period of about 30 years, there were still armies, but they fought around the, the fringes, the boundaries, not in the empire itself. 
So there was a stability to life in the empire. So some would say it was the perfect time for the gospel to come, to be proclaimed, because the Roman roads, the Roman peace, would enable the spreading of the gospel. Now, I think that's a very simplistic answer, but that's an example of what someone would say as to why, this, why is this the right moment. Theologically, what has God been trying to do from the beginning of time? With the, think back to last year, with the call of Abraham and Sarah, with the, the experience of the bonding, the bonding with the people at Sinai, the covenant, uh, the, the taking possession of the promised land, the, the kings, um, the exile, and what that did to, to make Judaism a theocracy. So, you know, you can see it that way as it was the right time because of what God had been able to, how God had been able to lead the people in, into relationship with him. That now was the time, was the right time. The author of the letter to the Hebrews, and this is, I'm kind of, I, as you can tell, I'm kind of like squirming and not answering directly. Here is his explanation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In many and varied ways, God spoke of old to our ancestors by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Now, that doesn't solve it in detail, but it, it, it points to the same question. In God's good time, now you might look to Roman history, you might look to Judean history, you might look to the development of women and men, I don't know. The author of the Hebrews just says, God was pulling the string and this was the time. So, let's take a break, okay? Take a break, you can move around for a walk. Smoke a cigarette, whatever you gotta do, okay? <laughs> I know, I saw that. Okay. Okay.